What I see in family life uh, is, is the distortion that's produced by each of us having our separate, you know, and highly enthralling machines. And it's producing a kind of deep loneliness and a, a lack of connection. Hey, and welcome to Simbi Foundation's podcast, Impact in the 21st Century, the show that brings you stories of positive impact from the world's leading innovators, activists, authors, and entrepreneurs. Each episode is a chance for you to listen to inspiring and impactful individuals talk about the positive impact they've made and how they made it. I'm Aaron Friedland, your host of Impact in the 21st Century and founder of Simbi Foundation, a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the UN to build digital solar power classrooms called Bright Boxes to support the next 3.5 million learners in refugee settlements. To those of you returning for another episode, thank you for being part of this community and for taking the time out of your day to listen to our podcast. It's listeners like you that inspire us to share more impactful stories. And if this is your first time listening, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And if you enjoy the podcast, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the awesome and inspiring guest list we have lined up for you. And thank you to RBC for sponsoring this episode. And today I'm excited to be joined by Megan Cox Gordon. Her newest book, The Enchanted Hour The Miraculous Power of Reading Aloud in the Age of Distraction. Megan is also a well known essayist, book critic, Wall Street Journal contributor, parent of five, and so much more. And Megan, thank you for joining me today. I am delighted to be here. This is my favorite subject to discuss. Well, yeah, such a pleasure to connect. And, yeah. and I think when I reached out to your publicist, I mean, I love the world that we live in, that I can just reach out to one's publicist. And literally, so I'm reading, the book was gifted to me by a dear friend and colleague named Adrian Gear, who is just a wonderful human. And essentially, I'm reading the book, I'm sitting in the park, I start, this elderly woman starts speaking to me, and I really want to be reading the book. So I recommend that I read it aloud to her, and I explain the title to her. Right. She sits back very happily, and I just was blown away by the entire <laughs> experience. I felt amazing from it. Um, and shortly after, I sent your publicist an email, and here we are. Isn't it? It is remarkable, and it is wonderful. I mean, I do sort of deplore the effects of the internet on life, but you cannot get away from the miracle of it as well. Or to be able to, you know, I, I, I normally sing in a choir, uh, we obviously not singing anymore. And um, with this, I mean, it's wonderful sort of very high music choir. And, um, and because the choir has been sort of, you know, forced into retirement because of the pandemic, um, we've been having every couple of months, we've been having a, a Zoom call. And those, you know, this is very nice talking with one person in this way. I find them quite depleting, Zoom calls. It's as though my battery is being drained at double speed. I don't know why. Um, and I think that, that everyone was feeling that way. And so one day, the the right before we went on, the music director said, look, Megan, will you just read to us? So I read them the story of Orpheus, which is a perfect story for music, right, for people who sing. And it was, again, using this very, this medium, which is so inhumane in some respects, it, it was very effective. It, I, I, one of the things I was going to do before it all happened was to start a read aloud salon at home. Because, mm. you know, maybe to do things like, for instance, I've never read Goethe, right? You can't go to your grave without reading the great German romantic. So I was going to read, you know, the, 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 what's it called? The Trials of Werther or something to my friends and other people had other things that they hadn't read and they wanted to read. And then, you know, here we're not socializing now. So that is a treat to come, but I'm sorry, I'm using up valuable time here. So. No, that's okay. I, I love it. Out of curiosity, let just brainstorm with me for one second here while we're already on this salon tangent. How would you go about actually setting this up? What would that look like? So I think, I think the difficulty would be that it actually takes quite a long time, as you probably found. When you read something aloud, um, you are progressing word by word. Each word needs to be said and heard. So you don't necessarily read, you know, at a glacial pace, but what takes the eye a second to take in, you know, a single page, you can just run it down a line of text and you can get the gist, if not deep reading. Um, will take five minutes in person, you know, so there's, there's a question, I think there's a balance to be struck in the length of the text that you choose, 
uh, the patience of the people around you and also people's natural desire, especially the, the theatrical types and the hams in the crowd to be part of the reading. Um, so we've done it once or twice with some friends and I read with my husband, I read to my husband sometimes in the evening now. Um, and that's of course bilateral, it's very easy. We just read until we're tired of it. Um, but but I think that I think the trick is to find shorter pieces or excerpts of pieces yeah. to read. Um, one of the things I did when the pandemic hit was I was at home with, in fact, it was nice. I had a house full of people. I had seven people, including myself in the house. Um, and we had, it was great. Um, but one of the things I did was I read aloud on Instagram every day. I recorded myself reading and it, it was a real challenge, Aaron, to find to find stories short enough to do in Instagram gives you 15 minutes. That's all you can have if you want to put a video up. Um, and that, so, so that's, that's tricky. Poetry would be very good for reading aloud in a group setting mm -hmm. uh, or just a, a, a favorite chapter of a book. Um, one of my favorite children's books is uh, a tree grows in Brooklyn and virtually every chapter of that would lend itself to wonderful, I mean, it's just wonderful, zesty writing that instantly summons uh, images and scenes to mind. Um, so I think that's the, I think that's the difficult thing. And you have to find people, sorry, to go on about it. You have to find a group of people who are willing to um, move past the temporary discomfort of doing something which is not common anymore, mm -hmm. you know? It's a little like if you have friends who play music and, and then you put them together with friends who aren't used to hearing live music or don't have, don't play music in the home. There's often that little moment where the person who's unfamiliar with music right up close is a little uncomfortable, you know, and a little thrilled and gleeful and uncertain. And then you see them relax into this. It's okay to enjoy it in front of someone else. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. That's a really interesting insight, but yeah, I've, I've seen that firsthand and experienced it. Yeah. 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 It can be well, awkward, if, especially if you're dining and someone comes to your table with their violin or something, it's can be a little hard to know what, where to look in the home. You can relax a bit more. Mm -hmm. So Megan, what inspired you to write this book? Oh, uh, well, uh, I, I came to it. Well, all right. So, I had an experience, and I write about this in the introduction to The Enchanted Hour. Um, when I was not yet married, uh, my husband, my soon-to-be husband, and I went uh, to a dinner party at the house of a friend of mine who had started, she'd started life earlier. She had a couple of little boys by that time. She would eventually have four of them. And we were all, there were various people there for dinner, and uh, we were chatting over drinks. And then my friend just sort of left the room. And... She didn't come back and she was gone for a long time. And, and eventually it was a little bit awkward. And I, and I, somebody said, where, where did Lisa go? And her husband said, Oh, she's just reading to the boys. And it was like, it was like an electrifying moment for me because I thought she's just reading to the boys. She's reading to her boys when she has uh, adults here, because that's what she puts first in her family life. And so <laughs> I wasn't married, I didn't have children. And I thought, boy, if I ever do have children, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put reading aloud at the center of their lives and I'm gonna put it, make it the priority in our family life. Um, little did I suspect that I would eventually have five children. So with that first baby, this was the surprised by joy moment. Um, I, uh, I, I began reading to her when I brought her home from the hospital. I didn't, I was an only child, I didn't know how to interact with a baby, but I did know this one thing about reading. So the minute we, I got her home, that's what we began doing. And reading aloud to her was, uh, it was a tool to interact with her. It taught me how to understand her cues um, as time went on and she was joined by four other children. It was really the central civilizing uh, you know, event of our family life. Every night we would read for an hour or more. and. Um, and it was lovely. I mean, there were, you know, it wasn't always 100% lovely and it wasn't always 100% successful. Sometimes we chose books that were not, um, you know, did not thrill. And sometimes we didn't have very much time or something else would have got in the way. But generally speaking, this was really how we did it. So, so that's the personal side of it. I, I was, I, I knew something big was happening with my children when I read to them. I knew something I could feel, you know, you could feel there was something 
something emotional that was happening in the group. Something would happen when we, when we traveled through the story, through the language. They would pause sometimes and ask questions. Um, we would play little games with the text. If it was a picture book, you know, sort of seek and find games, that kind of thing, like where's the duck in the picture? And little sort of interactive exchanges. So I knew something big was happening. Um, and, uh, and then I don't want to kind of go on forever on this, on this, on this answer, but uh, there came a point when technology began interfering in our family life uh, or distorting our exchanges, distorting our relationships a little. And I realized that reading aloud this, this, this time that we had together every night was actually kind of almost an antidote. It was like a daily fortification against these distortions that were being introduced by technology. And so my journalistic antennae went up and I thought, well, let's look into this. What is happening here? Hence the book came along. So I'm sorry, that's a very thorough answer. That is a um, very thorough answer. That's how I got interested. <laughs> that's how it came to be. <laughs> And so I'm actually going to get back to you on technology and its disruption and what you call the sixth fairy. And we'll get to that in a moment. But before I do, I just, I'm, I'm genuinely curious if you could have anyone in history or living today, either read to you or read to them, who would you choose and what book would they be reading to you? Oh, okay. That's a wonderful question. I've never been asked that question before. And I, my answer is so, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, this person, uh, it's, his birthday is tomorrow. Uh, it is Robert Louis Stevenson. I would like him to read me Treasure Island. Uh, <laughs> because yeah, November 13th is Robert Louis Stevenson's birthday. And honestly, um, he's, yeah, <laughs> I think we should be, well, I'm glad we're, uh, honoring him in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just think he's a brilliant storyteller with a, uses language in a wonderful way, which both um, highly sophisticated, entirely accessible. Uh, he was just a marvelously talented man. And, uh, and so, so that's the answer to that question. All right. That's great. W when I was thinking about the question, I was thinking about, you know, who would I choose? And I decided that I would either choose Morgan Friedman or David Attenborough just to listen to their voices and I would have to choose Aldous Huxley's Island for them to be reading. And it got me thinking that I, I need to figure out a way to get one of them to actually make that happen. <laughs> I'm sure it can be done. I'm sure it can be done. So. Alas, I have no connection to either of them. I do have an English husband. That's as close as I get to David Attenborough. Okay, at some point I may have to hit you up for that. Okay, <laughs> it's a small island. I mean, what are the odds? There you go. So. You know, you're talking about this idea where you're you're seeing the pre the prevalence of technology. Um, it's it's essentially starting to enter your home. You're seeing how it's negatively impacting your children's lives in in certain respects. And in one of your talks, you refer to it as this six fairy that's essentially casting a spell on humanity. And I'm I'm wondering if you can share some thoughts on essentially the culture and the climate that you feel technology and screens have, have put humanity in and what you, where you see us currently headed and if there's anything that you think can actually be done. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, a, that's a kind of galaxy level question, isn't it? I mean, I think that we can, I, I know that you have talked with Marianne Wolf, uh, who has written a wonderful book, Reader Come Home, about mm -hmm. Uh, the way that our use of technology is stripping away our ability to engage in a really deep level with the written word. Um, and in fact, I, this summer, practiced deep reading. Um, I, I deep read her book, actually. I sat outside with it um, until I finished it with no phone around. And it is a very different experience, you know, when you, when you put the technology away. But, you know, as she found, uh, her use of technology had, it took her about two weeks, I believe she writes in the book, mm -hmm. uh, before she could re-engage with some of the beloved authors of her youth. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing that's happening to us. We are, we are, we are becoming, we are having a more shallow attachment to the written word and we are missing out on depth. There's been a great deal written about that. 
What I see in family life uh, is, is the distortion that's produced by each of us having our separate, you know, and highly enthralling machines. And it's producing a kind of deep loneliness and uh, a lack of connection. Uh, and, and this is, so, so in the book, really what I talk about in, in extolling the virtues of reading aloud, um, one of the arguments that I make is that if we can build this practice of warm human connection with another person, with a text in real time together, um, build that into our daily lives, we actually, you know, we strengthen our, our, ourselves with these other, you know, in, in, this, in, this, in this other relationship with our technology. Um, we can't always be on our phones, yet many of us are. I mean, really, I, I sometimes will come to myself and, you know, I'm, I'm no saint in this regard. Here's my phone right now. I know where it is all the time. And I, there have been times when I have, um, I've kind of come to my, almost like woken up from a spell and, and realized I'm just standing in the middle of the house looking at this thing. Um, so, so, I mean, that's a, a commonplace observation now. I think we all, you know, we all know this is happening. Uh, but but the, the profound loneliness that is happening in an atomized society, um, atomized families, uh, elderly people on their own, which of course is only a situation only made worse by the pandemic, much as the, you know, we've had a kind of outlet with our ability to connect, just as you and I are able to connect right now. I mean, that's, that's in itself a minor miracle, but it's not enough, you know? Uh, and so, so we need to find ways to connect. And there are other ways of connecting. One of the beautiful things about reading aloud in fomenting human connection is that there's a physical component, right? You're sitting next to someone. If you're with a child, they may even be sitting on your lap or practically, you know, tucked right up to you. That's lovely. Um, and there is, you know, as we know, a physiological reward that human beings who are social animals get from being in affectionate, warm company. Um, so there's, there's that, that immediate physical connection. There's a kind of, um, well, intellectual and spiritual connection that takes place, you know, the bridging of one person's spirit and intellect and the others finding a point of connection through the literature, through the story, through the language, it could be nonfiction, doesn't have to be, you know, literature, but that's a wonderful way to connect. Um, and, and there is, I mean, we even, you know, I don't go into great deal, detail about this in the book, but we know that when people are sharing a story, the patterns of, as it were, their, their brain patterns are, come to synchronize. So if, 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 if Robert Louis Stevenson were reading Treasure Island to me in this fantasy life, which I love that you described, uh, and, and someone had us both in an MRI at the same time, you would see that we were, our different domains were connecting and lighting up. Mm -hmm. I have to say parenthetically that I know that saying your brain lights up is not how neurologists describe it, but since I'm not a neurologist, I feel free to use the term. Forgive <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. But so, you know, that's a lot of connection taking place in what is essentially an incredibly simple act. It sure is. And, and when you think about the, the fact that you are sometimes standing in the middle of your house with your phone in hand, yeah. you know, there are deep behavioral economists and game mechanic designers have spent a lot of time making that happen. They have, they, they've got you primed where I, I do the same thing. I mean, every once in a while I find myself, it's like, I just checked Facebook. I just checked something else, just opened LinkedIn. And actually now for some reason I'm back on Facebook. Why yeah, you cycle through looking for and the hit? Yeah, exactly. You're getting that dopamine fix. Right. And when, when I think about speaking to you and your work, one of the questions that I have is how do we gamify and institutionalize and develop that reward based system so that when we, so that we are imprinted with this idea of reading aloud to each other at a young age, and so that it actually becomes a, a habitual fix that we look for, we look forward to actually getting that dopamine fix off. Do you have any insight into what we can be doing to motivate and encourage this continued behavior of reading aloud to different people? Um, I would say that you you had it in one of the first things you just said, which you said the word habit. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it became habitual in my family um, because I insisted on it 
it, well, first of all, I had a completely pliable creature, an, an infant, a newborn infant can't mm -hmm. go anywhere or express any desire to do anything else. She sits on your lap and you read. So it developed in me that habit. And when things were really wild with a whole house full of children, as I had for, for some time, uh, it sometimes felt as though, you know, satisfying that habit of reading aloud was more of a burden as it loomed on the horizon, you know, we'd get through dinner and it, okay, guys, we need to get upstairs, get everyone teeth brushed because we have to get to story time. And then there would be that moment where we would finally make it to this thing that had, it's, it, it would sometimes seem like, you know, it was, it was both habit and obligation. And then there was this fantastic sense of, of relief that would always, it, I mean, invariably would sweep over and you think, okay, this is actually, this is the best part of the day. This is lovely. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I would say, I, you know, I, would, I, I do encourage any parent to start as soon as you can and stick with it as long as you can uh, and make it as non-negotiable a, a daily pleasure, a daily routine as brushing teeth or any other, any other kind of sort of <laughs> hygiene, you mm -hmm. know, it makes it sound a bit clinical. Uh, but I, I do think that we do ourselves a great favor when we build healthy habits into our lives. We all of us are working on that all the time. January is typically the time, isn't it, right? The new year comes and it's, I will stand up straight and I will floss daily and I will walk my 10,000 steps. Well, building, you know, building five minutes of reading, read aloud time after dinner or even during dinner or before dinner or at any time in the day, just start, just do it. Do it one day at a time when you might be able to do it the next day and then do it the next day at that time. And, you know, it's, it's it, it, in this, in such a way we can build up this, this practice and this habit. And it is very rewarding. I will say one thing though, Erin, um, I, you know, and I, I do address this in the book a little, um, a lot of parents, younger parents in particular, uh, are, don't clearly remember a world without technology and feel that it is uh, that it is itself a kind of enhancement. So they might be inclined to want to read off the tablet or read off their phones or, or use, there's a, a phenomenon that I really deplore. I probably shouldn't name it, but there's a company that produces sound effects for read alouds. I know the company, I know what yeah. you're talking about. It just makes my heart sink. And every time I see them, advertising on Twitter, I want to say something mean, but I, but I don't because we all have to make our living. But I, um, you know, you don't need anything. You, in fact, technology mitigates against that close connection with the text and the other person. Um, I mean, there's abundant research in this. We, we know that technology interferes. Uh, I just actually, I leaned forward and hid my phone because I, I was aware of it after I talked about it, of it sort of glaring at me. But you know, if you and I sit together with this in sight, it impinges on our ability to connect. I mean, here we are doing through the screen, so this 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 doesn't count here. But you know, if we were in person, mm -hmm. it, it alters slightly. And if the phone goes off, it breaks the connection entirely. Well, the same thing is true when you know when parents are reading. If they're reading off a tablet, they know, and the child knows that underneath that image is a whole world of other images, and all those you know that cycle of dopamine that you described. Mm -hmm. In order to really enter that lovely zone where we're connecting uh, at the deepest levels, we have to put the phones away. We have to put them out of sight. Right. Five minutes, 10 minutes, it's not that hard. You just have to do it. Yeah, you know, I, it's, it's really interesting what you're talking about. And a, a part of me is fully on the same page with you and I, a part of me is all in. And there's another part, I think it's, uh, this part of realism that 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 disagrees and and essentially what 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 I'm constantly thinking about you know you, you can you can challenge there's a group of people who I love and who I wish the world was more like who says reading should only be done in books that is the only way that we should read and that group I don't think celebrates or realizes the fact that technology is so pervasive and 
it's it's just winning and i don't oh, need yeah. to tell you it's yeah. winning i can tell you that for the first time in human history the us is experiencing declining rates of literacy this is a higher income country i mean when we when we look around we see that the world's smartest people the greatest engineers they're not publishing books they're working to keep you scrolling for five more minutes yeah. and so the question that i'm constantly thinking about is how do we take and celebrate what you're describing yeah this positive activity of reading aloud but how do we recognize the current societal climate that we live in and how can we add aspects of gamification aspects yeah. of um reward and 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 also is there a way to actually change the way that people do perceive a tablet so that when for example they do open their read aloud app and they are connecting with their family member is there a way that you could just perceive that computer or like you're setting this alarm for 30 minutes you essentially cannot be using this computer or device for any other purpose all you can do is this activity are there ways that we can celebrate the tech that we do have you know i i will leave the answer to that to those who really know how to manipulate tech uh i i will say i mean your phrase the tech is winning is is I mean, I think you're right. Here's here's something. Here's a way of thinking about reading aloud that is um, that maybe is uh, conducive to some kind of. I don't want to say solution. That's far too overpromising. But mm -hmm. but think about it this way. So so in the book, I I, I there's a chapter about essentially loosely conceived the history of reading aloud. Uh, reading aloud now, when we think of it. Most of us think about about it taking place in this in a in a in the domestic setting with small children, right? Or maybe at library story time, or or maybe you know in a classroom if you have a a, a particularly enlightened English teacher who will read aloud to the class. Um, but other than that, it 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 seems to us like it's not something that is a normal way of life. But but in the book, I I make the argument, and I think successfully that that when we read aloud, we are essentially Uh, emulating the most ancient practice of oral storytelling, except that I'm not inventing the story. I'm I'm taking the story off the page um, that someone has carefully constructed with beautiful and inventive language. Uh, oral storytelling, narrative, is the is one of the human universals. It's it's as old as humanity. It, it, we can tell this from looking at cave paintings. You know, story is part of the way that we live as humans, and the way in which people, for millennia told stories was by telling them, passing them on orally. Um, even early forms of writing uh, were actually designed to be said out loud. I mean, they were, it was a tabulation that could be spoken aloud. And, and so by taking it off the tablet or taking it off the modern tablet, mm -hmm. uh, you are conjuring what is essentially speech. Now, this is, I think, a very important thing for understanding the power of reading aloud and why it's so brilliant for uh, for children who are developing, but also for adults um, who have broader vocabularies. And that is that we can, you know, we all have a much larger, uh, I'm actually forget, forgetting the phrase now, but essentially we can understand many more words spoken to us in context than we would naturally express mm -hmm. through our own language. Um, oh, receptive and, and expressive, that's it, sorry. I, I'm hitting, hitting my desk in my excitement. Um, our receptive capacities are much greater. Mm -hmm. So I might be able to read to you um, a fairly, you know, a sort of an esoteric piece of writing, and you might not know every single word, or you might not know every bit of syntax exactly, but in my, when I turn this complicated text into speech, you are primed to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. That's true with, with babies. You can say things to babies and long before they can express themselves, they can understand you. They begin to piece together the things that you're saying. They begin to make sense of what is being said to them. Uh, and, and that's true, you know, as we go through, through life. I mean, you and I, I'm sure have, we both read a lot. I'm sure we have very large vocabularies. We would not necessarily use all those words in our daily life. So there's something about this magical liberation of the word from the page that happens when we read aloud. Um, to your point about should reading only take, should only, you know, reading only be about books. I mean, I, it seems to me we're already in a kind of hybrid place. Uh, the work that you do with, uh, with Simbi, with uh, 
allowing children to, to read with their eyes and with their ears at the same time. That's a kind of, that's a, that's a kind of self read aloud, right? It's a, it's a, it's a tech hybrid of this lovely ancient tradition of oral storytelling. They're telling a story to themselves. So there may be something there, you know? Yeah, no, I fully agree with you. Now, I'm realizing we haven't touched on something that I think is quite important, and that is, can you, from, from the research that you've done, I'd love you to speak to some of the, your understandings of the positive impacts in general of reading. Like, why is reading actually good for us on a social, economic, political perspective? And then what are the benefits of reading aloud? The benefits, let's see, the benefits of reading aloud for the reader or for the readee, uh, one of the, one of, to return a little bit to what I was just saying, uh, one of the benefits of being read to uh, is that you gain access to worlds of language and imagination, uh, and you can have that wonderful out-of-body experience of occupying characters in a story. Um, you know, for the book, I went to a classroom in Baltimore, um, which was a library class actually run by a, a wonderful writer called Laura Amy Schlitz. Mm -hmm. um, she's the librarian at the Park School in Baltimore. And I got to sit in with these fourth graders while she read to them. She's a wonderful reader. I talked to the children afterwards about what their experience had been. I mean, they were, there was not a, there was not a peep in the classroom. This is one of the great things that you see when children are read to and somebody, the reader, has a good grasp of what they're doing is it is it absolutely casts a spell and i asked them afterwards what it had been like for them and i don't think they'd been asked this question before and they used wonderful these lovely uh young fresh ideas one of them said i feel like i'm flying over the story you know when she was reading another one said i felt like i was in the story and i was solving the puzzle of the story so th those those kind of you know from the mouths of babes <laughs> remarks mm -hmm. give us an insight into the thing that when when we you know when we engage with the text in a deep way we we really do we just leave our armchair and we just fly somewhere wonderful agreed um, there was a study done in southern England uh, I want to say now two came out two Septembers ago I think um, and uh, the study it looked at the effect of classroom reading on twelve and thirteen year olds. Um, who were struggling or average readers. So again, we're leaving the home setting here. But these are kids who probably started out behind, um, were not, you know, not doing well in, in their English classes or not, they were, you know, in remedial kind of classes. And they're right on the cusp of adolescence, right? An important time for confidence, for all sorts of things. Um, and and what the, what the study, so I'll, I'm just going to read you a little bit from the abstract here, and I'm paraphrasing here and there. So, Poorer adolescent readers are often regarded by teachers as uh, unable to read whole narratives. And so they're given short, simplified texts, and they're expected to analyze every part in a slow, laborious read-through. I mean, you can picture it, right? The teacher hands out a paragraph or a couple of paragraphs to the class, and that's, that's going to be their experience of English. And then, God forbid, that they go around the class and each kid has to read a sentence or a paragraph aloud. Well, instantly you get total panic. If a child is not confident with reading, it's very distressing. Your heart's pounding and all you're, you're not thinking about what the text is saying. You're thinking, oh God, she's going to get to me any second and then I have to read. And then if I screw it up, people are going to laugh because what is being 13 but being afraid that everyone thinks you're going to laugh? So in a mixed method study, 20 English teachers in the south of England changed their current practice to read, um, this was over the course of 12 weeks, instead of doing that kind of you know, pedagogical approach that I just mentioned. For, for 12 weeks, they just read novels, kind of challenging novels, out loud, at a pace that you or I might read to someone we love, at a pace that our audiobook might go at, you know, just an enjoyable pace. Um, and they read this to this, these, these kids. And at the end, the children were given some standardized tests on comprehension and language achievement. Um, the average student made in those 12 weeks, eight and a half months mean the progress on the tests. Wow. The poorer readers made 16 months progress. So simply reading challenging novels at a fast pace in each lesson 
and here's what they say in the abstract, they repositioned poorer readers as good readers, giving them a more engaged, uninterrupted reading experience over a sustained period. And there's, there's more in the study that, that will, I mean, there's, that's the kind of, you know, bland clinical language for it. Mm -hmm. But what's really touching are the little stories of the teachers. The teachers suddenly found they loved the engagement with their kids and the children would come. These were children who were like, Oh, I don't have to read. They came rushing in. They couldn't wait to hear the next chapter. They were excited for each day's class and they were getting the English language. You know, I mean, that's the thing, Aaron. It's, they were getting the vocabulary, the syntax, the grammar. They were getting the imagination. They were getting, getting the characterization. Listening? Just from What's listening? That? Yeah. Wow. Because, because again, it, I'm sorry. I'm, so wordy on this subject, but they, because, because the teachers were taking those novels and turning them into speech, right? Mm -hmm. And speech they can understand. So uh, if you take, if, if a teacher reads aloud to a classroom of mixed ability children, or a parent reads aloud mm -hmm. to a room full of their own, that person's own children of different ages, everybody can get the story. Everybody can follow along and everyone's getting it at the same time. So the able students, aren't farther ahead than the struggling students. They're mm -hmm. all getting it simultaneously. I mean, that's a kind of miracle of equality right there. That really is. Wow, I love that. Thank you. Can you I'm, uh, later on, I'm going to ask you to send me that, uh, that study. Oh, absolutely. I'd be delighted to. All right. Yeah. Megan, thank you. Oh, thank you, Aaron. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you for listening to this episode of Impact in the 21st Century, which was sponsored by RBC. We're truly grateful for RBC sponsorship, which helps Simbi Foundation further our mission to support the next 3.5 million learners in refugee settlements. So how do we do this? We collaborate with the UN and incredible partner communities to build solar-powered classrooms called Bright Boxes. You can learn more at simbifoundation.org. If you enjoyed this episode and think a family member, friend, or coworker would also enjoy it, feel free to share. A personal message goes a long way and will help us invite more awesome guests to join the conversation surrounding positive impact. But the conversation doesn't end here, and I'd love for you to join the discussion. So please leave a comment or reach out on social media to let us know what you thought about today's episode. In the meantime, wishing you all the best, and I hope you join us for our next episode. Music